Welcome back to Beyond the Headline, everyone, where we discuss the realities of launching, scaling, and investing in a business. I'm really excited you're here today because I'm joined by Mo Koifman, the general partner in New York for Spark Capital. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thanks for having me. Mo, you've been at Spark since back in 2008. Compare and contrast what it felt like making your first investment to your last investment in Bond Street. Um, well, I guess the, the most important thing is that I've learned a ton. Um, it's, um, you know, everybody told me when I was moving into venture capital what a long road it is and um, how it's an apprentice business and how it's all about pattern recognition. Um, and the reality is, you know, when I, when I joined Spark, I was pretty young um, um, and I, I really didn't know what I didn't know. And um, it's been quite a ride um, learning uh, what I've learned thus far and knowing that I'm still in the, in the early innings of what I have to learn. You know, I, I joined Spark in uh, 2008 when, you know, surreptitiously after I joined, the world collapsed. Um, Good timing. <laughs> yeah, and we had a year to 18 months of really battening down the hatches, and then I was able to be a part of, you know, one of the better runs that venture capital has seen in, in, in some time. And so... Um, um, I've just learned a lot through thick and thin and um, what I understand now in terms of what to look for in entrepreneurs, markets, businesses, metrics, uh, and then how to engage with an entrepreneur, how to engage properly with the company, with other co-investors, etc. Um, it's been quite an education for me. And so, um, you know, the thing that has really run true to me about venture is that um, it definitely is a long-term business. Um, and, you know, some people jump in and get lucky and the ball starts rolling. But I think the reality is, even for those folks, for anybody, um, to really learn how to be good at this business, I think, takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of, a lot of effort, um, a lot of patience, and a lot of learning. When it comes to that learning, I think on the outside, sometimes VC appears as a lot of intuition. So you have a meeting with a founder and right away you're like, all right, I'm going to invest. But I know that's not what it's like. What distinguishes an A-plus founder to you? The truth is I do think that's a lot of what it's like. Um, I think intuition is a big, big, big part of VC. Um, I think... Um, and, and by the way, the earlier stage you're investing, the more so this is true. Um, there's a lot of work that can be done in terms of understanding a market and its structure and unit economics, which are ever more important these days to really have a handle on, um, as well as um, being able to analyze the data of a company that's that's been around for a little bit, um, as well as references with market participants and other folks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of work that can be done, but the truth of the matter is work in this business can only get you so far. At the end of the day, you have to make a judgment call. You have to make a gut call about whether to invest in something or not. And this is true um, from the earliest stage investments all the way to friends of mine that are investing in the public markets. Um, I think the reality is that the amount of gut you need to make that decision is more, you know, is, is, is disproportionately, uh, is disproportionate to the amount of data that you have on those decisions. So perhaps as you move up the stack in terms of um, investments, there's, there's, you get closer and closer to perfect information. So um, you're able to analyze these things more and, and, and potentially uh, minimize the amount of, of gut and maximize the amount of work you can do. But at the end of the day, I think across the spectrum, the best investors um, 
can and should be judged by their gut, their ability to process as much information as is available, and ultimately make a call, um, whether they're picking a stock or backing an entrepreneur. And um, that's why everybody in the venture business talks about pattern recognition. That's why my point about learning this business is, is really feels so true to me, is that it just takes time to understand what makes a great entrepreneur and you know and there are by the way different types of great entrepreneurs but like you have to see it over and over again to have a real sense of it or um, you know what makes a great market opportunity or company that's hit a vein or a wonderful product or whatever those combination of factors is that leads you to want to do something um, that's where I think pattern recognition matters because it informs your gut so that so that when you're making a gut call, you're making it based on, you know, inputs that give you a little more confidence in 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 that assessment. I'm so glad you said that and now I just feel like it's so much more intense, which is great. <laughs> Was you talk about the different learnings, can you give an example maybe with one of your portfolio companies when you've seen that come into play? Um um, you know, it's hard to give a portfolio company example, um, uh, but what I, I guess what I can tell you, you know, to your question about entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurs, I think, you know, I think it's easier to um, understand repeat entrepreneurs in terms of how they look at the world, what they do, um, how they approach building companies, what they're like to interact with. There's Again, there's more data there. It's a more understood person. Um, as it relates to um, first-time entrepreneurs, which has become you know, more and more of a reality in the venture business, especially with so many folks uh, coming out of school and immediately um, starting companies or being inspired to start companies or having, you know, worked for, for shorter and shorter periods of time before they jump into the entrepreneurial fray. You know, to me, that's an example of where pattern recognition becomes so important is how do you gauge, how do you judge a first-time entrepreneur in terms of their ability to be successful. And some of it is just understanding the product that they've built and or the market that they've chosen to go into or that they seem to be creating. But some of it is understanding, you know, um, some of the cues that they give off and some of the ways they approach the world and, you know, their humility or uh, the combination of humility and sort of the necessary arrogance or naivete and how are those things balanced to make it, you know, someone that you think has the opportunity to be successful, how they are able to put people around them to recruit, to engage, um, to, to partner with really smart people. Um, do they listen? Do they not listen? Um, uh, you know, it's just, uh, there's a, there's a bunch of things that you start to see, um, in these interesting cocktails um, with 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 founders that I think help you sort of have a gut, uh, which again can be right or wrong, but at least to feel better and better about your gut for the kind of founders founders that, that you ultimately want to back. What role do you like to play with those founders once you invest? Um, you know. I, I think, again, that's the other thing that just takes time to figure out, which is um, I think you want to play the role of like being extremely helpful, but when needed. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be too in their face, too on top of them um, in their way. You want founders to be empowered to build their company, but at the same time, you want them to feel comfortable coming to you with anything and everything. In a way, it's kind of like 
a shrink relationship, over, <laughs> right? Like, if you want to come see me, come see me. If you don't want to come see me, that's okay too. But when you do come see me, I want you to feel comfortable sharing everything with me and really viewing me as a thought partner and somebody that can add strategic value. Um, but taken one step further, like people can know about our relationship and you can utilize <laughs> me, employ me, you know, to help recruit somebody or close a deal or whatever it is that you're looking for beyond just you know, batting around the strategic issue. Um, so it's, it's a delicate balance to make sure that you um, provide the level of help and support that entrepreneurs need and are looking for while giving them the rope to, to build their businesses and to do what they need to do. Who are some founders, whether you've invested in them or not, that you really admire and you think the world needs more of? Um, well, you know, I think Mark Zuckerberg is an obvious answer, but, um, I think you have to give him a tremendous amount of credit insofar as you had a guy dropping out of school who built one of the most significant companies in the world, has never given up the seat of power, both in terms of being the CEO and controlling the business, has put incredibly talented, talented people around him, from Cheryl and Chris and all the way on down. Um, he's not threatened by any of those folks, but rather is emboldened, empowered and made better by them, and has impressed me so much strategically. Um, in terms of not being myopic in his thinking, willing to take big risks in terms of changing the Facebook product, in terms of acquisitions, whether they be Instagram or, um, or um, uh, you know, um, any of the, uh, I'm totally blanking on, uh, on the, the biggest messaging product in the What's world. What's app and on Oculus WhatsApp. and Thank tons you. of stuff. I wanted to say WeChat, but I knew that was the wrong <laughs> answer. But whether it's Instagram or WhatsApp or Oculus, which um, was one of our portfolio companies in terms of investing in a new platform, I think Mark is willing to take risk um, in a very controlled way, but in a very bold way. And I think shows a combination of vision, execution, and risk-taking that's extremely admirable, much in the way that the Google founders have done over time. Um, you know, I think, um, I think in our own portfolio or in my own portfolio, um, when I look at um, Zach and William, the founders of Plaid, which is one of my portfolio companies, you know, I really, from the moment I met those guys, um, they had that combination of dogged, kind of naive determinism about kind of their ability to build something of value and to win, while at the same time being able to listen to people around them. Um, not being afraid to hire terrifically talented people around them, taking their time with how they approach things. Um, you know, I've just been extremely impressed um, by how big they think, but how deliberately they operate. And so, you know, just to give you one example that's top of mind um, in my portf portfolio, um, you know, I give those guys a lot of credit and have been continually impressed. Um, by how they execute. I love how you discuss, and it's as you described VC earlier, as taking risks and having that intuition, but also having that pattern recognition to guide you. As you go and invest in companies, what's your decision-making process? Like when the risk comes in and you're a little nervous, when do you go for it? You know, I mean, it depends if I'm looking at something really early or a bit further along um, with our growth fund. Um, Let's go early because that's more risk. 
Yeah, you know, ironically these days, there's risk across the board. Um, perhaps there's more risk of, of zero um, on the early stage side, but um, there's a lot of risk given the valuations on the growth side as well. So the amount of work that you need to do to really get smart um, about a company, about the market you're entering, um, uh, you know, sure, maybe there's some downside protection, but, you know, returning capital is not going to uh, help you uh, raise a lot of funds in the future. So it's a different kind of risk, certainly. Um, but uh, there's a lot of intuition and a lot of, uh, you know, pattern recognition and thoughtfulness, I think, across the spectrum um, that needs to go into it. On the earlier stage side, you know, I think you do the work that you can do to understand the market, to really have a sense of the product that you are backing and making sure that it's best in class and using it whether it's a consumer product or a B2B product, really engaging with that product and engaging with early users or customers of the product to understand whether it delights them or not. Um, and then I think the most important part of it on the earliest stages is just spending real time with an entrepreneur and having a sense that, they, that they're special. And that's... Um, I wish that was something that I could bottle up into a sauce and tell you what the recipe is or sell it to somebody that wants to douse themselves in it. But it's sort of something that you know when you see. Um, and it, it, it doesn't mean that they'll always be uh, successful. And it doesn't mean that every time you think you know it, you'll be right. But that's really what you're training yourself to try and see. Um, and to try and unearth in people. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's uh, not easy to do. It lends to the learning that you were discussing. When you reflect on the last seven and a half years now, what learning has made the biggest impact on you? If you could pick one. Um... I think it's that um, ideas are a dime a dozen. Um, and execution is the hardest thing in the world. And it's not to say that you should ever spend time pursuing bad ideas or small ideas or ideas that you don't think are bold enough or big enough or interesting enough to be incredibly valuable. Um, but it is to say that the person or people that are executing on those and their ability to execute on it is, is even more important at the end of the day. And especially in the earliest stages, but throughout, um, throughout the life cycle of a company, um, the importance of people has become, it was always important to me, and it's become um, just the, 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 the pinnacle, the most crucial element um, of what I look for when I'm investing in things from a signal point of view. Um, and I'd say that's something that I've increasingly just gotten sharper and sharper on, and um, uh, is something that I care about quite a bit when I'm looking at new investments. Great. So I want to end with just a few <laughs> questions about life. So these ones are, of course, most important. Mo, you are a burger-making champion. <laughs> and that, that is a real thing. You've won three times. What is the magic of the Mo Burger? Um, simplicity, um, uniformity, and just the right balance of... Um, salty, sour, savory, sweet, um, the umami, so to speak. Um, the, the thing is, and I think this is true in startups. I, I was just going to say, this sounds like business. Yeah, people tend to overcomplicate things. Um, and the best products are the things that are 
usually the most simple. They have this ability to, to, to cut through the noise with something extremely simple, yet it touches on all of the nerves that people want to be, um, uh, want to experience. And if you're able to deliver that consistently and repeatedly, I think you can delight people and then you can train people to expect that you'll delight them. And those are, those sound the same, but they're actually different. One is about the power of an initial experience and then the other is sort of the power of the brand. And I think those two things go hand in hand. And I think, you know, simplicity, um, execution, um, and just giving people what they want in the most digestible format um, is a recipe for success. I can't believe that you just summed all of that up in a reference of a burger. That's pretty impressive. It's, it's honestly the way I look at it. Mo, if you could change one thing about the world, what would you want to change? Uh, if I could change one thing about the world. Um, it's a very interesting question, perhaps a bit, a bit too broad. Um, you know, I think that instead of giving you an answer um, about, you know, fighting or ending poverty or, um, <clears throat> you know, ending war or increase, you know, like increasing tolerance, etc. I think I, I think I kind of want to try and effectuate as many of those things as I possibly can. Um, but I'll give you an answer that, that maybe is a bit more tactical, but perhaps underlies all those things, which is, I would like to make access to information, access to uh, the internet specifically, and everything that comes with it, um, free and accessible to all people everywhere. And the reason I, I think about that is because, to me, information is power, information is the great leveler. Um, Information is the first step to an enlightened, engaged, um, thoughtful populace in my mind. Sure, information can be misused, but I fundamentally believe that if people had access to all of the greatest evolution of thinking of the Western world and the Eastern world and wherever goodness is coming from, um, that we would hopefully be able to harness and to unlock and to harness the better qualities of humanity versus the worst qualities of humanity. And so to me, I want to give people access to information so they can educate themselves, they can be smarter, they can know more, they can advance, um, and, uh, and hopefully they can get on the right side of making this world a better place versus on the wrong side of continuing to, um, uh, um, continuing to promote intolerance and, and hatred that I think too often exists um, in various parts of the world and everywhere for that matter. So that's, and I think that's something that we in the, in the technology world have the power to influence to some degree. And so, um, you know, that's probably what I'd spend my time thinking about. That's a good one. And you're making me rethink a lot of things. I feel like I'm learning so much. So this one, much easier question. It's the last one. If you were an ice cream flavor, what flavor would you be? Mint chocolate chip, no doubt. That type of, there you go. That's why you're a VC. Make Absolutely no quick. question. <laughs> chocolate, mint, refreshing, but sweet. And I tell you which one I'd be. Uh, I, well, actually, that's not true. Their strawberry is the one that I love. But mint chocolate chip is my ice cream of choice. I love it. Mo, thank you so much. I feel like 
I learned so much and I have a new perspective going in on a lot of things. How can everyone stay up to date with you and what your team is doing at Spark? You know, I, I think we're all pretty active on social media and we're all out there and we're all available and we're at conferences and we're talking and we're reachable and, you know, I think we pride ourselves on being, um, on being available. Um, and so uh, lots of ways to reach us. I think, you know, uh, that's not the, the that, sh that shouldn't be the bottleneck. So we're here, we're available, um, we're ready to chat with um, anybody that has something interesting to, to bring our way or uh, in any way that we can help. So, um, you know, thank you so much for uh, making the time to do this and hopefully, um, hopefully you got what you were looking for. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Have a great day.